Uh, my name is uh, Raul Gracia Tinedo. I come from a, I'm a PhD student at the Universidad Rubira Virgili in Spain. And I'm going to present this paper entitled SGN, Mimicking Datasets for Content Generation in Storage Benchmarks that has been done in an internship jointly with IBM uh, Research Haifa and Tel Aviv University. So let me start the talk with an analogy. Uh, one of my hobbies is hiking. And normally, when I, for hiking, I bring a backpack. Um, as you may guess, the contents of the backpack are relevant when you uh, walk in the mountain. So you will feel a difference if you carry an empty backpack or if the backpack is full of stones. In general, if the backpack is heavy, you, your hiking performance will decrease. Now let's think in a data file as a backpack. For many storage systems, the contents of files do not really affect their performance. However, if a storage system integrates data reduction techniques such as compression or deduplication, then the contents of files uh, matter as the content of the backpack when you are hiking. So we believe that storage benchmarks should be aware of that. So let's start with some brief uh, introduction about benchmarking. So benchmarking is very important uh, to evaluate the storage systems in a reproducible manner. So there are a variety of benchmarks in uh, some uh, many storage domains, such as file system, databases, and so on. And apart from generating synthetic workloads, uh, there are some uh, many storage benchmarks that try to emulate real-world uh, situations, like uh, emulating um, the operations per unit of time or read-write behavior of some systems and applications. However, trying to emulate the data that as a storage system actually matter, that actually manages, uh, has received much less attention. So normally, we can find two typical approaches to, solve, to feed a storage benchmark with data. The first one is to resort to real data sets. That's good because in a real, data, in a real data sets from real applications are representative. But the problem with this is that they are normally proprietary and the owners are not willing to share it. And also, they can be potentially very large and impractical to share. The other option that many storage uh, Benchmark is uh, to generate data in simple ways, such as filling the payloads of IOs with random data or zeros, which is easy to create and reproducible, but is not representative. So as I mentioned in the example of the backpack, this paper focus, focuses on the role of uh, data in the performance of storage systems. To show the relevance of this problem, we use as an example ZFS, which is a file system with uh, embedded com uh, from compression built in. So in the figure, uh, we see uh, two groups of bars. Um, in the left, the left group shows the write times on one gigabyte files filled with random data. And the group on the right represents the same, but for files filled with zeros. So also, the white bar is uh, ZFS without compression. And the gray and black bars is uh, different compression algorithms uh, in ZFS. So first, we clearly see that there is a difference between difference in performance uh, between writing files which are random and writing files that are filled with zeros. And this is basically due to two main reasons. The first one is that compression can really reduce the amount of uh, data which is actually written to the storage, which increase performance, and also uh, in, in the performance of the system is involved the compression time that an algorithm uh, takes to actually compress data. And we also uh, observe that depending on the algorithm, the performance of ZFS varies. So the main conclusion that we want to draw here is that the contents of files matter uh, for the performance of the storage uh, systems, in this case with compression built in, and that storage benchmark should take care of that. Of course, we are not the first ones to notice that generating data with a certain compressibility is important in a benchmark. So there are a few benchmarks like LinkBench of FIO uh, that let the user to decide the uh, mean compression ratio for the data. This is good and is basically done by mixing uh, compressible and incompressible sequences in a data chunk. For example, here we see as 50% compressible chunk, which is done, uh, which is formed by two random sequences and two zero sequences. Uh, however, this method has drawbacks. The first one is that generation, generating the data 
uh, with a mean compression radio basically is hiding or not capturing the heterogeneity of data sets. Second, by generating data in this way, most compression engines will exhibit the same compression performance um, or the same compressibility uh, for a given synthetic chunk. Uh, as you can observe, zeros will be compressed, well compressed by uh, most compressors, and random data won't be compressed. So irrespective of, of the algorithm, all the algorithms will exhibit like 50% compressibility. This can seem good, but it's actually what is contrary to what happens in reality, uh, since the distinct compressor achieve different compression ratios. And the third uh, and the last problem is, relating, is related to compression times. In the plot here, we illustrate compression times for Zilip digesting text data chunks and synthetic data chunks of the same compression ratio generated with LinkBench. As we can see, compression times in, synth in synthetic chunks generated in this approach are very far, far from the behavior of real data chunks, and this, of course, affects to the performance of storage systems. So we face a complex situation where most benchmarks generate unrealistic contents and representative data is normally not shared because it's not practical and there are also uh, privacy issues around it. So this is bad for the performance evaluation of a storage system with uh, data reduction techniques built in. And we believe that we need a common approach to generate realistic and reproducible benchmarking data. In particular, in this work, we focus on compression. So this is the summary of our work. So first, we present SDGen, which is a synthetic data generator, which is an open and extensible framework to generate realistic data for storage benchmarks. The goal, the main idea behind SDGen is to mimic or emulate the properties of data sets that matter to data reduction techniques. Moreover, SDGen is designed to produce compact, reusable, and essentially anonymized characterizations of data sets. Another contribution of this work is to design and integrate a method to produce synthetic data uh, for compressors, so, this, so they will behave similarly in both an original data set and a mimic um, synthetic data set. And finally, to, you, to show the usability of our framework, we integrated SDGen in popular benchmarks like LinkBench or Impressions. So SDGen is built upon the concept of mimicking method, uh, which is basically the procedure of scanning a data set to extract uh, the properties of data that matter to a particular data reduction technique in order to generate, generate similar synthetic data. With this in mind, the life cycle of SDGen works as follows. First, SDGen uh, uh, digests a target data set and splits it into chunks. In each data set, SDGen executes one or more scanners that extract certain properties of data in form of statistics, for example. Then, these properties of data uh, are persisted in a compact uh, characterization file. This characterization can then be shared easily among other users. And this user will be able of generating synthetic data similar to the original one uh, based on that data set characterization. And this can be done and they, uh, without having um, access to the original data set. So also the technical details, of course, are written in the paper. The SDGN can scan the entire data set, or it also resorts to sampling which is uh, very useful to scan very large data sets. So this is the, more or less the concept of, of the framework. Uh, but of course, to implement a particular mimicking method um, requires knowing what to scan for and how to generate data. And we are going to do this for uh, compressors. So next we describe the mimicking method that we designed to generate synthetic data for compression engines. So basically we found two main properties that really affect the performance of compressors. So the first property is the distribution of repetitions within a file or a data chunk, okay? So the first plot here shows the frequency of repetition of a given length for two data types, which are PDFs and text data. And as we can observe, irrespective of the data type, what we found is that uh, repetitions, uh, short repetitions are very much, uh, uh, are more frequent, and uh, larger repetitions are quite less frequent. 
So this has an important role on the compression performance. Secondly, we also found that uh, the distribution of byte frequencies is also important. In the second plot, we observe the frequencies of bytes depending on the data type. As we can observe, PDF, because they are like uh, random like data, uh, all the bytes exhibit similar frequencies. However, in text, bytes, uh, there are bytes which are much more frequent than others, for example, in the English alphabet. In our mimicking method, during the scan phase, we try to capture those properties to build a characterization file. So then to generate data, we need to achieve two main goals, okay? The first is, uh, of course, uh, to emulate the scanned properties in the synthetic data. And the second goal is to generate data with a reasonable throughput. So at high level, um, we generate a, a data chunk, a synthetic data chunk as follows. So first, we, um, we set up a generator that output bytes based on the uh, frequencies of bytes found in the original chunk. Then we initialize a source of repetitions, which is basically a sequence that will be kept during the generation process of the entire synthetic chunk. With this in place, we start to build a synthetic chunk by interleaving repeated and non-repeated data as follows. Um, we take random decisions about if we want to insert a repetition or not. In the, case, in the case of inserting a repetition, first we have to know uh, the length of this repetition. We, so we take it from the repetition histogram that we scanned before. So we get the length of the repetition and we just take the prefix of the source of repetitions that we generated initially. And then this subsequence is inserted in the synthetic chunk that we are generating. In the case of generating a non-repeated uh, sequence, we basically insert newly randomized data also from the generator. Uh, of course, we also take the sequence length from the repetition uh, length histogram that we capture in the original data chunk, and we generate a newly, uh, newly randomized data of uh, this length, and we insert it in the chunk. So by doing so and so, we finally get a synthetic uh, data chunk of the desired size. So this is a very high level over generation mimicking method. You can find, of course, more details in the paper. But uh, let's uh, show some results of this work. So this is at high level also um, our evaluation framework. So we first focus on the objective metrics uh, to meet, which are compression ratio or compression factor and uh, compression time. And we also, we also uh, are interested to, to check uh, how close we emulate the repetition that, um, how close we emula emulate the properties that we scan in the original data. Um, we employed a variety of data sets, uh, so just to give a sense on the universality of our generation method. And um, we in, in this work, we basically target lossless compression, compression uh, based on, rep on um, byte level repetition finding or entro and or entropy coding. So there are the popular, popular ZLIP and LC4 algorithm which are uh, currently um, integrated in, in many storage systems. But we also tested our uh, synthetic data with other families of compressors uh, which are very different like BZIP or LZMA. And in the paper you can check that for the non-targeted compressors the results are probably less tight but uh, that for the targeted compressors, but also acceptable for, uh, for benchmarking. So to explain the tale from the beginning, let's see how, how well we emulate the properties that uh, we first scan. So in this first experiment, uh, we basically show the re repetition length distribution, which is the upper plot. Uh, of both the, the data generated with SDGN and uh, observed in the real uh, data, and we observed that they are uh, very similar, the distributions are very similar, following a kind of power low trend. In the lower plot, we show per each chunk, so the distribution, basically, the entropy CDF of the synthetic chunks and the real data chunks 
for various data sets. And we also observe that they, they are similar, so SDGN roughly, roughly follows the shape of the original data. So next, having this, we uh, inspect what one of our objectives, which is the compression times and ratios of two uh, popular lossless compression, like LC4 and Zilip, compressing uh, chunks of real data and mimic data sets. So in the right mod, uh, rightmost uh, plots, we observe the compression ratio uh, distribution of uh, synthetic chunks and uh, real, ch uh, real data chunks are very similar. And also po we point out that we can emulate the heterogeneity of uh, compressibility within a data set. Um, the second is about compression time. So one, one of the novelties of this work is that we find, um, we find an analogous resource regarding the chunk compression times. So although compression times are normally harder to mimic, especially for LC4, uh, LC4 because it is really fast and very sensitive to any variation, for most data types, compression times are also closely mimicked. So the ultimate goal of SDGN is to generate data that makes a storage system using data reduction to behave similarly for both the original and the synthetic data sets. So to explore this, we, repeated the, we repeat the experiment that I introduced in the motivation. So in this plot, we show the throughput of, data, of uh, ZFS writing one gigabyte files filled with uh, different data types. So again, we can see that uh, ZFS performs similarly writing either original or synthetic data. We achieve this even for extreme data types, uh, such as D DNA sequencing files, which are included in the Calgary corpus that we selected as a text data set, uh, which makes uh, GZIP to perform badly. As we showed in the motivation, LinkBench, LinkBench data is much easier to compress, and this impacts on the performance of ZFS. So for this reason, the right throughput of ZFS is, uh, is much faster in, in using data generated with uh, LinkBench. So next, we want to demonstrate the, that SDGN can be integrated with existing benchmark just to serve to them as a data generation layer. We executed a write workload with LinkBench, making, uh, making use again of ZFS, and in this case, we make use uh, uh, of an SSD drive as a storage backend. In this experiment, which is basically a database, a database workload, uh, we show the difference on the write latency depending on the payload contents of insert operations and the compression configuration of ZFS. As baseline cases, we filled insert payload with random data, which is the dark gray line, and with zero data, which is the light gray line. Then, uh, to fit the benchmark with real data, we also used uh, as, ins as insert payloads uh, random offsets of the Calgary corpus and text data, which is the black line. And we did the same with the synthetic uh, data set generated from the Calgary corpus. With, uh, by SDGN. Uh, the light green line corresponds to ZFS without compression. As we can see, the red latency of operations is very similar making use of text data and the synthetic data generated by LinkBench, which demonstrates the usability of our framework. Making use of unrealistic payloads makes a big difference in red latency. So let me conclude. So in this work, we focus on the relevance of data for a storage system that integrate data reduction techniques, and of course, also to the data performance evaluation. We presented SDGen, which is a framework that, retaking the analogy of the backpack, aims at inspecting your backpack to fill other backpacks with artificial content. So you will experience a similar hiking performance irrespective of the backpack that you bring to the mountain. So finally, we plan to extend SDGN to mimic uh, also data duplication in the future, uh, but which is also more challenging, and of course, doing mimicking the duplication and, and combine it with data compression, which is a possible uh, future research line. 
And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Vasily Tarasov, IBM Research. So I'm oh, wondering, sorry. do you have any numbers about the throughput with which you can generate the data per core? Yeah. I have a backup slide about this. So um, I thought that you were going to ask something about this. So in our initial uh, implementation, um, one of the good things of SGN is that chunks can be produced in parallel. Okay, so as you can see here, uh, here is uh, the, the bars are basically the throughput, the generation throughput of SDGN, uh, generating two different types of data. The first one is to mimicking text data, and the second one is mimicking media media files, okay, which are random. So the good thing is that the throughput scales like uh, as the more threads here in the X axis, we can see the generation threads. So the more generation threads we have, the more throughput uh, we get. One of the observations here is that, for example, generating text data is, um, is uh, much faster than generating uh, uh, media data. And, it's, and that's because um, the number of random decisions that should be done generating media data, which is basically uh, JPEG, uh, MP3, which, are ran which is random data, um, SDGN should uh, execute many more random decisions, so this takes more time. Uh, in the other case, we make use of more repetition, so we get more throughput. But I think that this, uh, this can be uh, improved by making a good reuse of, uh, the, of the random data. So do not generate every time random, new random data. But you, I think that reusing it in a wise uh, manner, we can improve the throughput also for uh, random lake data. Yeah, I think that's that that's probably should be the focus because, you know, five megabytes per second per core is a, yeah, you know, it's one core. Yeah, in the for text data you can get up to sixty, and also take into account that this is a, like a standard machine. It's not like a kind of high performance server or nothing like that. It's just a regular PC. But uh, but yeah, it's, it's something that we can improve in the future, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those numbers there, is that what entropy source are you using? If it's if that's such a performance bottleneck that you're what you, you, you mentioned is a possible future performance optimization reuse of, reusing your random data there on your on your slide here. Yeah, yeah. The thing is that the current algorithm basically is generating new random bytes every time. So right. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering what what actual entropy source are you using that? Is this like a live C random call or are you really yeah, isn't, yeah, it's random? implemented in, in Java. So yeah, basically okay. it's a random library from from okay. Java. And is that is that I mean, it, it it seems surprisingly slow. Is that like a cryptographically secure random number generator or something? Yeah, I think that is uh, if I remember well, if it's like the standard uh, random generation, the standard random library in Java. But um, yeah, it's slow because you know for every byte thing that you know we have to generate like 32K, so we are going in a, as I showed before, uh, the lengths of subsequences that we are appending in a synthetic data chunks are, put, are very small. So we have to generate like a lot of very small sequences. Most of them, especially for the media files, are really, uh, are, are mostly random. So it's basically like uh, doing a whole process to generate random data. And this can be improved, of course. That we, we have to do this, but you know, uh, it's, it's something that I think that is, easily solvable. Okay. Yes, thank you. Tim Feldman with Seagate. Um, my question is sort of the opposite. Um, the, my question is during the scan phase to characterize <laughs> data, do you have an idea of the computational complexity and whether it's feasible if you were snooping data in flight to characterize data? Um, we didn't try that because most of the use cases that we put in practice uh, where like, okay, you are a company, you have a data set, so we have time, like scan it, and then give me the, give me the um, characterization file, and then we generate. So this should be only done once, and the generation part should be done like many times. But I think that it's, of course, a CPU-consuming task, but also will depend on your mimicking method. So 
if the metrics that you are going to capture from real data are very complex, it will take more time. And probably for a high throughput real time system, it will be hard to, to do it with a reasonable, uh, in a reasonable amount of time. But if in this case, our, our metrics are quite uh, simple. So I think that uh, there are scenarios of real time processing that could be done this. Like take samples of an input stream and take uh, like a chunk characterization from a real time input stream. Thank you.